Welcome and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Using Digital Threat Intelligence Management to Combat Threats, Understanding the Ins and Outs of DTIM Platforms. My name is Raleigh Goulds and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Our featured speakers are David Monahan, Re Managing Research Director at Enterprise Management Associates, and Alain Arvat, CPO and Co-Founder at Insight. David's in-depth security experience, which spans over 20 years, has included organizing and managing physical and information security programs. He has contributed content to a wide variety of industry forums and periodicals, including State Tech, CIO, CSO, and Computer World Magazine. Alan has vast experience and knowledge in the world of cyber threat intelligence and has succeeded in working in the most advanced environments in the world. After serving in an elite intelligence unit in the Israeli Defense Forces, Alan joined Guy Nizan to establish Cyber School, a center providing teenagers with courses, seminars, and summer camp workshops on cyber intelligence. And before I hand things over to today's featured speakers, I wanted the audience to know that today's event is being recorded, and you will receive a follow-up email from EMA that will include the on-demand playback, as well as some additional resources. Also, while David and Alon will be concluding today's event by taking your questions, feel free to log them anytime using the Q&A functionality. And now I'd like to go ahead and turn things over to our first featured speaker, David Monahan. David? Thanks, Raleigh, and thanks everyone for joining us today. We have some really interesting content for you, so we'll just get right into it. First of all, with the uh, research that we, we just did around Digital Threat Intelligence Management, or DTIM as I'll use for the acronym, uh, we, we had a number of qualifications that we wanted to, to impose upon the vendors that we were talking about. So what I'm going to do right now is talk about why we think DTIM is important, and then what the classifications were, and then we'll go into some of the, uh, some of the details around that. So first of all, why invest in DTIM? Uh, we think that uh, this particular area is increasing and growing in need and not just desire uh, because of the digital threats that we're, we're seeing out there. Now, from a, uh, from a, a historical perspective, in the last couple of years, we've seen a significant increase in cyber crime. Uh, the FBI has reported that, according to 2016 over here, that uh, $1.3 billion was lost in the U.S. alone in cyber crime. If you look and step back from a worldwide perspective, just looking at the, uh, the phishing scams and things like that that take place, we've seen over $5 billion in losses between 2013 and 2016. So, so this is not just a small drop in the bucket kind of, kind of thing here, right? It, it's very, uh, very uh, epidemic across the world. Between 2015 and 2016 alone, which is you know, two and a half years ago at this point, we saw a, a, over a 2,000% increase in, uh, in the figures of, of loss. So, so this, is, this is growing, it's huge. And, and uh, the other issue that we're seeing, which I think is very important, is the fact that uh, the, the, the uh, cybercrime organizations are, are getting better, right? That the gap between what a nation state can do and what a, uh, an organization can do uh, that's just doing this for money are, are, are shrinking, right? These people are able to get a hold of talent. They're paying big dollars because it is big business. Uh, when you're raking in multiple billions of dollars across the industry, you can afford to pay for the top talent. And there's a lot of talent out there that's willing to sell themselves to do whatever uh, to get that buck. Additionally, some of the other things that we're seeing, and I'm sure you've all seen the, uh, the, the news around lost credentials, lost records. So there's over a billion personal records and a billion different credentials that were stolen in 2016 alone. Uh, you know, huge. Yahoo lost multiple billions. Uh, other companies lost you know, tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands. So uh, it racks up over the course of the year. And in fact, as Verizon did their uh, 2017 Verizon Data Breach Investigation Report, uh, they noticed that, that one of the, the key issues that still resolve, revolves around breaches is that the number one method of identification is uh, an external notification from somebody. So they see your information online or for sale, or they've seen something that indicates there's a breach and says, hey, guys, I just want to let you know, I think you've got a problem. And, uh, and they have to go, the internal company goes back and looks, oh, wow, this is embarrassing. We'll, we'll go back and find that. So this is, a, a, this is pretty tra traumatic that the best way we can find out that we're on fire is for somebody else to tell us that we're smoking. Right? That, that's not a good thing. 
Uh, the other thing that we're seeing is uh, from, a, from a motivation perspective, about 68% of the cyber breaches are motivated financially, directly financially, which means someone's breaking in, they're stealing your information for whatever type it is, and then they're, they're out to sell it. Right? They, for, they've either got a previous deal or they've got, they're going to post it on the dark web or, uh, or whatever the case is, but, uh, but they want to get uh, compensation out of that. Uh, additionally to that, the, uh, only 25% are driven by other motivations. So, so that would be things like, uh, excuse me, the, the espionage, things like that, right? So, so from that perspective, you've got uh, you've got a nation state, or you've got some other kind of uh, internal issue going on between uh, entities that are trying to uh, compete for various spots in the marketplace. So, 25% of that is kind of off the shelf. They're not out to sell it. They're out to make money off of it, but they're going to use it internally. And then you've got 7% that uh, there are all the other things, whether that's socially motivated, politically motivated, you know, et cetera, right? But it's non-financial. So if you look at uh, the volume of records that are being stolen, uh, as well as the motivations, uh, the DTIM solutions that are out there searching and looking for your information to help you identify it on the web uh, fall into about 75 potential, uh, potentially 75% of the breaches out there. So three-quarters of the breaches you could get a handle on faster by using a DTM solution to help you look across the, the Internet. So, so that's, that's a big uh, motivator, in my opinion, for, uh, for looking at these types of technology. Right? Again, we don't want someone else to tell us we're on fire. Uh, we want to go out there and find out there's a problem. So uh, ultimately, DTIM's goal is to reduce the, the, the identification time. So you're not waiting weeks to months to find out that something has happened. You're, you're going to find out uh, ahead of time uh, within like that 24 hour, that critical, that critical period. Now the other thing that's, that's interesting about that is it's not just about information that's stolen from you. Right? That's a big focus, obviously, uh, but it's also about uh, other organizations that are trying to induce fraud by using your brand name, customers, whatever, whatever the case is. But they're, they're not related to you. They're not representative of you, but they're trying to pose that so they can either uh, gather your customers fraudulently or they can cut into your market share by using your name brand uh, or whatever the case is. And DTM is also meant to help you in those cases. And, and without that type of a tool, there's really no way you're going to find that information without just having a whole herd of people sit down on the Internet and start scanning. And that's not really scalable or, or cost effective. So what did, what did we define DTIM as? Right? Platforms and aid organizations with external threat identification and risk management by locating, gathering, and assimilating threat intelligence from a variety of sources. And, and the key portion below that is not just a data feed. So within that particular area, I, I think it's important that we understand that, that, that this is an evolution that's taken place. The, the first types of tools in this area were uh, threat intelligence feeds. And they would be huge blobs of data that someone could download and then parse through and, and do all of the, the basic work on to try and find out if there was something in that blob of data that related to them. And I think these started, I think I remember hearing about them first in about 2003, maybe 2005. Uh, and and they, were, they were huge. They were, they were unwieldy. They had lots of duplicate information, lots of old information. It was an attempt to, to get information out to everybody, but really only the top 1% of organizations could deal with it because you had to have a huge amount of storage, which wasn't cheap, and you had to have a very large uh, capacity for processing, and then you had to have people to deal with it. And so the evolution next to that were threat intelligence platforms that came along. And they said, okay, look, we see this as a problem. We want to make this uh, information available to more people. So we're going to add the ability to do more analysis and, and, better, and better deduplication and filtering and, and things like that. So the, so the platforms began to evolve from that perspective. But both of these particular areas were still driven primarily by Internet protocol information, right? uh, whether it was domain information, IP addresses, host names, whatever the case is. And so they're still primarily focused on that. The next evolution we get into is with digital threat intelligence management. Uh, and I see this as where we, we get into better analytics, better processing. Uh, we also expanded the scope. So it's no longer just Internet protocol information. We're looking at social media. We're looking at mobile apps. We're, we're looking at the deep web and what's for sale down in there. And so there's, there's a lot more types of information that are representative in the evolution of digital threat intelligence management. So we're looking across all these platforms and, and data. Uh, and then we get, again, the deduplication, better data feeds, uh, et cetera. And within that, it's all coming into a central user interface that can be filtered, searched, uh, qu queried, investigated, and you can use that to, to manage your investigation. So a couple of other criteria that we thought were important. One, we thought any, anybody we're going to include in this has to have a paying customer. And we think that's important because I, I talk to over 300 companies a year just in security, 
and uh, some of them are very small. They have some beta testing going on. Uh, they may be a little more smoke and mirrors, right? They have a great idea and a great thought, but the technology hasn't really been able to be developed yet, uh, or it's not ready for prime time, alpha, beta customers, etc. So we think it's important you've gotten to the point where, where customers are ready to put down their money to use your platform. Uh, additionally, the, the, middle, the middle item is, I think, important as well. Food information has to be externally verifiable. Uh, now, any information that's gathered from these platforms in whatever way, and we'll talk about that in, 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 as we go along as well, uh, it's out there, right? So you just have to be able to find it. So even if it would take somebody two hours to find this information and get there, we wanted to be able to verify that, there's, that the information is there. So it's not, it's not fake news, if you will. Like, I think that's important to, to get away from the fake news aspect, and we've all heard that term a lot. But it also happens with, with, uh, with companies. There's uh, uh, you know, companies in the past that have had uh, some, some big issues with that and, and, and had suspect data. And once that's the case, the whole thing kind of falls apart. Uh, the last one is customer validated time savings. So we actually interviewed customers from the, from the companies that we talked to and said, hey, you know, are you really finding value? You bought this tool and, uh, and you invested in it. What's the deal? What, how, what's going on? How, how are things going for you? And we found that the customers that had invested in that were really able to change their paradigm from a huge information gathering time frame. My volume of time spent, 80 to 90 percent of the time that the analysts had were spent gathering data and correlating the data and putting it together to make the case. And only 10 percent was actually being, 10 to 20 percent was being spent on being able to, to actually uh, remediate the issue, stop the offense, whatever the case is. And uh, these customers are able to actually flip that paradigm around and say, hey, look, now we can take all these resources we had that were just gathering data. We can complete and, and, and identify, not only identify, but resolve these issues. Uh, and actually, these other resources that we have for other value-added uh, aspects within the company, whether that's hunting or architecture review or working with their internal customers or whatever. So there was a huge time savings uh, on the part of those who invested in the technology as well. When we looked at the technology itself, the criteria for inclusion, there were over 100 different KPIs or key performance indicators that we had. We broke them down into five main categories, as you can see here. We have architecture integration, deployment administration, functionality, cost advantage, and vendor strength. And each one of these is important because uh, ultimately uh, they each have a, an aspect of either time savings, cost savings, uh, performance capabilities, you know, whatever the case is. And then in the last one with the vendor strength, um, that's absolutely important because ultimately we want to make sure that the vendor is going to be around, right? Uh, and, and the things that they're going to do to help us uh, as part of their solution Will, will continue to evolve because nothing is static. As we kind of looked at the evolution of threat feeds, the DTIM, uh, this is not static, right? Things are evolving. There's new avenues of attack. There's new avenues of fraud, uh, and there's new places to try and uh, do bad things, if you will. Right? That's, a, that's a generic term, of course, but you get the idea. Now, uh, within the vendors themselves, we had several different things that we looked at in terms of data collection, aggregation, and so forth. And so ultimately, uh, the first two things are, it, was the vendor a, a data aggregator or a data creator or collector? Uh, and they can do both, right? So the first one, data aggregators say, you know, we're going to uh, engage in one of the three of these items below. We're either going to take openly available sources, we're going to use government sources, or we're going to use private subscriptions, and we're going to take that data, we're going we're to put it together into one place, again, do all the duplication and filtering and so forth, and give you the valuable information. When you get to data creation or collection, uh, those vendors can also have proprietary collection methods. They've got some kind of sensors out there or honeypots or whatever they're using to gather information about threats, and they're going to include that into their, uh, their data, their data uh, uh, blob as well. I'll call it a blob for lack of a better term. But, th but that data is all put together. So ultimately, there's four different sources you can see in the middle row that affect uh, the, the volume and quantity and quality of the information. Uh, additionally, on the bottom layer, you can see we have six different means of collecting data, and this goes along with what we talked about from, from the evolution. Right? Originally, threat intelligence feeds were common Internet, all the IP information. And then we started adding in uh, the deep and dark web. And, and if you're not familiar with those, the deep web are things that are generally password gated. You have to be part of a community, part of a forum, part of something to be able to get to the information. And the dark web is all the stuff that's usually uh, Tor, Tor uh, access only. And, and has all of the illicit crazy stuff that's going on, whether it's you know, drugs, gun, uh, drugs, guns, information, et cetera. So, so you know, if you don't have those capabilities, you're missing out on a huge portion. The common internet, is actually, common internet is actually a very small portion of the overall data in those three that are related to the internet at large. 
And then we have mobile email and social. So, so ultimately you need to be able to tap into those because people do send information via, via uh, email, of course. They post information via social media, hey, I'm going to do this, or I saw this, or here's, here's what's going on. We've all seen crazy posts from people on social media, as well as mobile. And mobile specifically is around mobile apps and fraudulent mobile apps, uh, things like that that are going on where people are trying to steal your customers again, steal information from your customers based on trying to impersonate the, uh, your company information. Key areas for vendor selection. So this is something that's important for you as a buyer that we believe. So first of all is, is deployment flexibility. What, what do you want to do with it? Do you want it as a managed service? Right? I don't have the resource. I don't have the time. I want you to do it and tell me when there's a problem. On-premises, right? I, I want to own it. I want to manage it. There's either there's some regulation or there's some requirement from our business that we're going to install it and put it here. Of course, there's the cloud, right? If you can't do it on-premises, then you want to be able to do it in the cloud. And, and lastly, in, deliver, in terms of delivery for on-premises, do you want it as software? Do you want an appliance? Do you want an image? So you need to understand what your requirements for deployment is before you go and purchase solutions. Some solutions have all of these. Some solutions only have one and anywhere in between. So that's a key area for your vendor selection. Another area is data accuracy and actionability. So if, if you think of the, the, the extreme uh, line here, right, on one end you have everything is false positives. There's lots of junk, lots of trash in the information. You have very poor analysis. So ultimately you want to have better analysis and move yourself along this curve this way. Right? Once you get to a superior analysis, of course your accuracy is going to go up. So you want to understand what they're doing to manage that data from an analysis uh, perspective, what algorithms they're using from a high perspective, right? Are they using machine learning, deep learning, Bayesian, uh, statistical deviation, wh whatever they're doing, right? What are they doing? So you need to understand that very well so that you understand how it's going to affect the, the level of false positives you get versus the level of accuracy you're going to have. Uh, additionally to that, uh, what kind of automation do they, do they have, right? If you don't have automation in your process, you probably are going to have either business losses or interruption. More likely it's going to appear in the form of a business loss. If there's a fraud out there or a fraudulent app or somebody else is doing something or selling your information, right, you're not going to find it faster, uh, and therefore somebody else is going to be taking you know, parts of your revenue or, or parts of your company. If you're able to add automation, then you can find it faster, and you have the capability to remediate faster, uh, therefore closing the gap and closing the revenue loss or the customer loss or, or aggravation that can come across in there. Key areas for vendor selection, total cost of ownership, right? Whether you choose a managed service, on-premises, cloud, etc., you need to understand the, uh, the financial impact of each of these areas, these administrations, right? Do I, do I have to have professional services? Uh, they, is it able to integrate with other tools that I have to facilitate that automation, or do I have to do it manually? Uh, and lastly is licensing. Is it licensed as a SaaS model? Is it perpetual? Is it per user, per event, per whatever? Right? So, so absolutely ask those questions to understand how this is going to affect your bottom line and your budgeting within your organization as well. What about the ROI? So we talked about total cost of ownership. Now that we know what it's going to cost us, how do we get the return on investment? How do we convince the board or whoever has to uh, manage uh, that or authorize that budget that we're going to be able to, to, to essentially get our money back, if you will. So first of all, you need to understand what productivity improvements. I talked a little bit about that with some of the customers, going from 80% investigation to, to 80% uh, uh, re resolution, right, and, and that kind of thing. Uh, is this going to be a cost avoidance uh, item? So, hey, I don't have to add headcount, which is cost avoidance. I don't have to buy these whatevers. I don't have to con contract with some other services. These are all cost avoidance. It could be cost reduction. Hey, I don't have to have as much storage. I don't need as much processing. Uh, you know, maybe it's, I don't have to have as many people applied to this particular aspect of the business, which can be a cost reduction for that function, and I can apply those resources to other areas that I would have had to uh, have done that. And then lastly, your brand erosion. Anytime someone is stealing your information, if, they're t if someone else is telling you you're on fire, that's going to impact your brand as soon as that hits the news. Whereas at least if, if you've had a breach and someone's gotten through the door or they're committing fraud against you and you're able to say, hey, we've identified this, we're proactive. Right, that comes off as a much stronger stance to the media, to your customers, uh, investors, etc. Company strength. So we talked about that just a little bit as well. So this is important to understand you know, from, a, from the, uh, the overall company perspective. What's their debt portfolio look like? Uh, many of these companies have started out with some sort of a VC or angel investor, personal investments, etc. Uh, and we want to make sure that, uh, that given that debt, they have a sufficient amount of revenue. We want to make sure they're going to stay around. 
right? And you, don't, you don't want to invest uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in a technology that then disappears. So, so the debt and the revenue are, are, are both very important. Customer attention, ask them, you know, can, I, can I talk to a customer and get your own opinions from that customer? And very good at that. And you can, you know, if, you, if, you, if you're a customer of a technology, hopefully you, you share the same thing. And that I will share my view. Here, here's the good, the bad, and the ugly. I'm not here to disparage the vendor because I didn't buy them because I think they stink, right? I bought them because I think they're the best in the area for my use cases. And so hopefully uh, from that perspective, you know, you'll share that same information. Here's why I bought them. Here are my use cases. Uh, and here are the things that I think that aren't so great about them that, that we're trying to improve. But then those, that particular aspect comes back to the last two, responsiveness and support quality. So responsiveness is, you know, I've got this problem. I've had it for two years, and they won't fix it. I'm really aggravated. Or I've got this problem. I told, I told them about it, and, you know, we're on track to fix this in three months. It's great. Or even in six months, depending upon the type of problem. It might even be a quick fix. Uh, but, the, but the question is, is how responsive are they to those issues that you have come up with in terms of whatever it is, UI, workflows, et cetera? And then lastly is the support quality. When I call on the support, how, uh, how well am I supported? Is it done in my native language? Is it done in my native country? Uh, and, and people will have differing opinions about that, but, but the cultures and the language can be a barrier in support, especially if you're in a stressful time or stressful you know, situation. If you're calling in because something's broken and you can't understand the person, it's not their fault. It's just a difference, right? Then that's a problem. Uh, support quality as well in terms of how is it the whole, well, reboot and call me back in 30 minutes, right? None of us like that. So hopefully the support quality is a little higher than that. You get to someone that really knows what's going on and they can help you uh, in a faster manner because in this case, time is money. Business drivers, you need to understand what your business drivers are for purchasing this type of a solution. Is it just to reduce your total cost uh, of management or is it to get some kind of return on investment? What, what are the drivers there? And those are absolutely in drivers uh, within, within a budgeting and an IT and security perspective. Of course, it could be that, hey, you know what, we've noticed increased threats or risks, and we need to address that. Or we feel that we don't have the level of awareness and visibility that we need into these other areas of the web and compromise, and so we want to invest in that so we don't get caught you know, uh, with a sucker punch and someone's telling us, again, that we're, we're smoking and we didn't even realize that we were on fire. Uh, is it a compliance driven issue? Uh, that could very well be. Uh, also, third-party risk is a huge area now. Right? We, we've seen this growing, and it, it happened well before Target, but unfortunately for Target, it became the poster child in that. And it's, you know, it's just one of those things that happens. We, we've each got uh, our, our issues in our environment, but we all have third party that we deal with, whether they're partners, vendors, uh, et cetera. But we need to understand that there's certain levels of risk involved, and, and does a solution help us to, to, to deal with that third-party risk at all? And, and there, there are specifically designed third-party risk management solutions, and DTM is not a risk management solution from that perspective, uh, but it does help you know, are you seeing information about that third party out there in one of these forms? Oh, yeah, dude, I got passwords to their, to their HVAC system. Oh, well, wait a hold on. That tells me something about the third party risk uh, that I have, and maybe I need to be the one telling my third party vendor that they're smoking, right? Uh, and lastly, maybe it's you're trying to move to the cloud. You have solutions for various things. Maybe the vendor you had before or ha had an on-premises only solution, uh, and you're trying to move it to the cloud, whatever it is. Think about your business drivers and make sure you identify those as part of your requirements before you actually go out and purchase solutions. So a little about insights, right? They were one of the, one of the uh, contenders in this. And, and, and ultimately, you know, why did we think that they had a strong value in this area? Uh, well, one of them is tailored protection, right? You, you can specify the types of protection or the types of information you're looking for. You can feed that in, and you can get a very good understanding of, of what's going on within the, uh, the information. They're able to take uh, existing data and aggregate it. They can also take uh, original data from other places, and they can put that in. They can correlate information across uh, the different sources. Let's say you want to look at internal and external, right? What am I seeing on the outside? What am I seeing on the inside? Uh, and that's a big, big uh, help as well. They do have a huge number of data integrations with other tools, so that's very, very helpful to you. You don't have to worry about creating your own middleware or things like that. And so ultimately, that's a, uh, that's a huge uh, value as well. And lastly, the visibility, right? They create the visibility that you're looking for to understand what the threats are against you out there on the Internet. So, so we, each one of these was, was an aspect of their, uh, their strong value. What do we think were some of their strengths? Deployment flexibility, uh, the data integrations that I mentioned before, the breadth of monitoring that they can provide based on the information that you can feed in. 
Also, one of the key aspects, we talked about automation earlier, automated remediation was a, was a big thing. Right? The more they can do to help you to move the process along uh, for remediation, the better. Because oftentimes those particular situations are very difficult uh, to manage manually, and it takes relationships, it takes time, uh, because you're dealing with ISPs or other organizations that you don't control. Right? You may have very, very little direct influence on. So, so automating as much of that process as possible uh, is excellent. Ultimately, we also felt that Insights was a vendor to watch. They were they're a fairly new vendor uh, in the area, but but uh, but with the uh, with the qualifications that they were able to show us, and the information they were able to provide, uh, we did believe that they had a a good future in this area, and that uh, you should keep an eye on them. So as you're looking at DTIM vendors, uh, you know consider Insights as a, as an option, and uh, and ask them the tough questions. I think they'll have good answers for you. Again, we we asked them over 100 different KPIs about how they do, what they do, where they do, etc. Uh, and we felt that, that given the information they were able to provide, we were able to verify that, that they, uh, they had a good foothold on this. A little bit of an overview in the report, right? So how they stacked up. Uh, you can see each here we had the functionality and vendor strength. They were outstanding in functionality. They got outstanding in all but three of the areas, and they were strong in two and solid in one. So outstanding was the top, uh, and then at the, at the, at the, uh, the bottom we had needs improvement. There were five levels. So, so they did very, very well in, in, in uh, data management, in digital threat management overall. Reporting flexibility, of course, uh, with reporting, we haven't really talked about that much, but, but absolutely in these types of areas, if you can get the data in but you can't get it out, not doing you a lot of good. So reporting is, is absolutely a strong point. We felt that their financial strength was, was very good, four out of five dollar signs, that's very good. And we also felt that their vision strategy and direction was very strong, so, so they uh, did very well uh, overall. Uh, additionally to that, you can see in deployment administration and architecture, uh, they had several outstanding in each category. Uh, deployment flexibility was great. We, we loved that. It was outstanding. As well as license adoption, they gave us a lot of different means, or they gave their customers a lot of different means to be able to license the solution uh, to, to fit your needs. You know, how, uh, where do you want it? How much do you need? That kind of thing. Architecture, very, very good. Outstanding as well. Integration is outstanding as well as detection identification analysis. So I think at the very bottom there, I want to hit on that for just a moment in terms of the detection identification. Uh, you know, this is a key aspect of the technology. Right? We're, we're taking in data and or creating our own data, getting the system, but, but ultimately it comes down to the ability to analyze that data and get those actionable items to the analyst in order to deal with the situation. If you can't do that, again, wait, I've got a great data repository, so what? Uh, yeah, I can search it, so what? If I'm still behind the curve, that's really no better than a data feed, really. Right? So we really want to keep into that DTIM area and provide the output that those analysts are going to need in a timely fashion and in a usable fashion, uh, and they were outstanding in that particular area. So at this point, I'm going to hand off to Alon and uh, let him go. Alon, take it away. Thank you very much, David, for your presentation, and uh, hello, everyone. So I called uh, my part, a Lesson Learned, Building a Threat Intelligence RSP. And it's lesson learned because in the past few years, I had the chance to speak to numerous stock managers, threat intelligence leaders, CISOs, and other security personnel, discussing them threat intelligence use cases and what they use for threat intelligence. And I came to the conclusion that the threat intelligence space is very, very confusing, and therefore it's very challenging for security personnel to build a requirement for a threat intelligence or a threat intelligence platform. So if you take firewall space, for example, so it's very easy. You know you need a firewall. You know which vendors provide with a firewall solution. You go and you can test their solutions. In the threat intelligence space, it's actually extremely confusing because in threat intelligence, everyone is saying, I'm doing threat intelligence. You go to firewall vendor that would say, I'm doing threat intelligence. You go to SIM a provider that would say, I'm doing threat intelligence. And it actually becomes extremely confusing and therefore very, very challenging to try and figure out what is threat intelligence, what I need to do in my threat intelligence program, what of solutions I need to have in order to have an effective threat intelligence program. And this is why we took on ourselves the mission to actually try and help security personnel understand what are the requirements from a threat intelligence solution or platform, and what is the right strategy when starting to build an effective threat intelligence program. And this is where I, I want to start 
and talk about, first of all, what is the strategy I need to have in place when I'm talking and thinking about my threat intelligence program. And second, when getting into details and very, very specific requirements, how do I need to build this requirement in order to find the best solution for my organization? And let's start from the high level. What are the, the key components of the, a threat intelligence uh, platform that you would like to have as part of your threat intelligence and security strategy? So the first one is tailored intelligence. So in general intelligence, you're looking for threats targeting your organization in specific. When talking about tailored intelligence, you usually talk about analyzing your external digital footprint, whether it's on the dark web, on cybercrime forums, hacker chat rooms, or black markets, or whether it's on social media, uh, application stores, various search engines, and information sharing websites, trying to find hackers planning to attack you, try to find different tools built to attack your organization in specific, and actually identifying the most um, accurate threat against my organization. This is why it's called tailored. And this is the first piece or first capability you need to think of when you build your threat intelligence program. The second one is about the general intelligence, meaning general intelligence about threats now trending around the world. Usually this type of intelligence or intelligence feeds are translated into IOCs, indicators of compromise, that can help you identify different type of threats in your environment. So the next capability on a threat intelligence platform would be helping you ingest and aggregate all the different intelligence feeds you can consume, whether it's from your partners, whether it's from uh, the government, whether it's from open source feeds, managing it all on a one platform, having the ability to analyze the IOCs and actually try to prioritize the different IOCs that are more important for your organization to monitor. So that's the second piece of IOCs enrichment and management. The third piece, which I feel is often overlooked, is automated remediation. And this is something very, very important. From what I had the experience to see, many vendors see themselves as information providers, meaning I will provide information about different types of threats that I'm able to identify out there and relevant to your organization. And I think is that these vendors are actually missing the most important thing, and that's the fact that we're not threat intelligence providers, we are security providers, meaning organizations don't look for more information to read. They don't look for additional data they need to go through and read through and analyze. They want to do security. They want the organization to be more secure. And this is why I think that a key component in a threat intelligence platform or when, we look, when you look for a threat intelligence platform is to find a platform that will provide you with the remediation to automatically block the threat in your environment, whether, whether it's by integrating with your security devices, uh, or whether it's by feeding your SIM device, and also having external remediation to take down different uh, phishing domains, uh, fake uh, mobile applications, uh, fake phishing websites, or things like that, that can ha actually help you convert the intelligence into security. And the last piece is uh, threat intelligence uh, research and analysis actually allowing you to do deeper diving into specific threats, getting more context, doing attribution to the uh, relevant threat text or relevant campaign, and really getting the full story behind a specific indicator or a specific threat. And now I want to show you what I think is the most important slide in my presentation or the, the tip or threat intelligence platform evaluation cheat sheet. And I think that once, at least personally for me, when I did this pyramid of the different capabilities in the threat intelligence platform, that made a lot of sense to me. And that actually allows me, and I think if you follow this methodology, it will also allow you to classify each solution into one of the uh, layers in the pyramid. So the first layer, as I mentioned, is tailored intelligence and threat visibility. 
meaning visibility to different threats targeting your organization that can be identified out there, whether it's on the dark web, whether it's on social media, or other sources. So it can be around phishing sites or phishing domains. It can be around attack indications, different indications of hackers planning to attack your organization, exploitable data, meaning technical information relevant to your organization that has been disclosed out there and can be used by potential attackers, dark web intelligence, intelligence from cyber platforms, black markets, or other places on the dark web, brand security, meaning fake social media profiles or fake mobile applications that can be used to target your employees or your uh, customers, and data leakage, meaning sensitive information is leaked outside, whether it's credentials, um, private details of your employees, confidential documents. When we're talking about banks, so it's also around credit cards and financial data, but anything that is very sensitive and can be leaked outside. That's the first layer. The second layer, usually provided by a threat intelligence platform provider, this is how they call themselves, is around providing the ability to manage your IOTs, meaning aggregate IOTs from multiple sources, whether it's open source, intelligence feeds or information from your peers. Having the ability to investigate different IOTs, so now I identified a suspicious indicator in my environment. I want to get more context and do attribution. So having the ability to get this from the IOTs um, enrichment part. And also share the intelligence across peers or across your industry to make sure you have the most up-to-date information about different threats uh, trending out there. Then we have the layer of the threat uh, research and analysis. Here we want to understand the different trends that I have uh, or that are out there today, um, um, whether, whether it's around trending malware or trending threat actors or things like that, and the ability to really deep dive and do link analysis and research around specific threats, whether it's a threat targeting my organization, whether it's an IOC that I want to get deeper into, but really having the ability to get more context and do attribution to different uh, threads that are out there, and also understanding what type of threats are trending out there, there so I can build my intelligence uh, strategy and solutions based on that. And the last layer that I think is relevant also to all the other layers, and all the other layers should lead to this layer in specific, is the automated remediation. So actually, everything should end in the remediation. So if I identify fake uh, mobile application or fake social media profile, it should lead to takedown of this profile or application, meaning external remediation. If I get IOCs from my peers, IOCs from open source feeds, or IOCs that I identify myself, it should go straight to automated remediation to block or monitor these IOCs in my environment. So I want to have these IOCs automatically prioritized and sent for blocking or monitoring in my, in, in my uh, organizational environment. Another use case, credential leakage. So I don't only want to know about credential leakage, I also want to integrate with my active directory and first check if these credentials are valid or maybe it's false positive, and then also uh, reset the password if it is relevant. So I don't only want to know about credentials that were leaked outside, I also want to automatically remediate the threat and making sure that the credentials that were leaked or the phishing domain that's going to attack me is being mitigated in my organizational environment to make sure that I'm safe and not vulnerable to this specific threat. So the automated remediation is on top of everything because this is where it should all end, in remediation and essentially in having better security from our organization. And now let's try to dive a bit deeper to different requirements that you should have or you would like to see in your potential uh, vendor of threat intelligence platform. So I'm not going to really get into all the tiny details but actually focus on the most important things that I feel you should look for when trying to find the right 
and good for you as threat intelligence platform. So first of all, when we talk about tailored intelligence, it's important to classify the different type of threats you want your tailored intelligence provider to identify and detect for you out there. So the first one is phishing, meaning phishing websites or potentially lookalike domains that can be used for spear phishing against your organization. So when you're talking about phishing and you want to find the best vendor for phishing, you have to first make sure that your vendor has the ability to identify domain, lookalike domains in near real time, meaning the vendor should have the capability to automatically query DNS servers and WHOIS servers so you, he'll be able to identify the fake domains that look like your organizational domain in near real time and to block it very, very fast. Because today, around four or five hours after a domain is being registered, it's already being used for spear phishing attack. And this is why it's crucial to identify the fake domain near real time upon registration. My tip for you is to first look for a vendor that can help you identify the phishing threat, whether it's phishing websites or phishing domains, but my tip is to make sure that your vendor has the ability to identify the phishing domains or websites in real time by querying all the time DNS and WHOIS servers so he'll be able to detect it upon registration. So the first part is really the phishing. The second is around data leakage, which is, I think, definitely one of the most important use cases that you should have when you talk about a terrorist intelligence provider. So here you obviously want to look for leaked credentials. Uh, leaked credentials can be published uh, out in the wild on forums or pastebin or similar websites, or many times it's originated in uh, major breaches like the LinkedIn breach or um, Adobe breach that was a few years ago. So these breaches actually expose a lot of uh, passwords are commonly used by or potentially used by your employees. This is why you want to monitor and make sure your vendor can find or identify leaked credentials from both forums and page sites, but also from databases that were leaked outside um, on the dark web or just published on some file sharing websites, and he, he can find these credentials on these databases and let you know what's relevant to your organization. The other and next very important tip that I think you should make sure you get from your uh, payroll intelligence vendor is leaked confidential documents. And I think this is something very, very important because many times this use case is overlooked. So we're focused, focused on uh, credentials, we're focused on credit cards that were leaked or private leak, uh, details that were leaked outside. But many times, confidential document leakage is overlooked. And I think this is something very, very important, especially when we're talking about reflecting the value of threat intelligence to, to senior management. This is something very, very important because this has a direct business impact. So my tip in data leakage is to look for vendors that can uh, alert you about a leakage of confidential documents. Now the next piece is vulnerabilities. So I think that uh, uh, this piece, you should look for um, a solution that can identify different technical data that is exposed publicly and can be potentially used by hackers to attack your organization. So here there are plenty of use cases, but the most important thing is to make sure that your vendor looks at your digital footprint and is able to identify different technical data that is leaked outside and can be potentially used by attackers. Then we go to attack indications. So attack indication is something very, very broad, right? In the indication of a potential attack can be um, um, activity on black market of illegal trading, or can be someone putting you on a target list, or can be um, um, I don't know, someone planning some kind of attack. And here my tip is to look for a vendor that looks at the dark web. Because attack indications can be found in all types of shapes and in all types of sources, but I think that really the major attack indica indications can be found on the dark web. So I think that the key thing here on attack indications is to make sure that 
you're, you are looking at the dark web and make sure that you're able to identify different attack indications and attack intentions on the dark web because the most imminent attacks or threats will probably be found on the dark web, on cybercrime forums, black market, or hacker chat rooms. Then we're going to executive monitoring. So here the idea is to focus on the key personnel in your organization that hold the most sensitive information to see if their information was leaked, if anyone is planning to attack them in specific, and even if you can monitor their personal emails, for example, that can be very, very helpful to identify a potential attack and making sure that the key personnel in your organization that holds the most sensitive information are actually monitored and have um, a more um, protection that the average employee has. So this is something very, very important. And it's also important because you want to show the executive the value of the solution that you purchase. And by monitoring threats relevant for them, that can really help you um, convey the value of insights to, um, to the executive level. And the last part is brand security. So like I said before, in brand security, you need to focus on um, fake profiles or fake up on social media or fake mobile applications and make sure you have the ability to identify them and also mitigate them so they will be removed from the social media or removed from the uh, application source. Now I would like to go to the threat uh, research and analysis and IOCs enrichment and management. And here I would like to give um, two tips. One around research and analysis. I think the most important thing is to make sure that the research and analysis part of the platform can allow you to do attribution and get more context about a specific indicator found in your environment or a specific threat in focus. So it can be through a threat knowledge base that the vendor is maintaining with information about malware, campaign, or threat textures, or uh, different trends he provides you. But the most important thing is that you will have the tools to put inside an indicator or a threat and get more context and help you with contribution. When we talk about IOCs enrichment and management, I think the most, the, the most important thing here is to make sure that your vendor is able to take an IOC and prioritize it. Because IOCs, if you cover uh, the, even only the main sources out there for IOCs, you still get hundreds or thousands of IOCs a day. And this is why one of the key things is the ability of your vendor to enrich the IOCs and prioritize them to make sure you look only at the most important IOCs and that you protect yourself or monitor only the most relevant IOCs or the most severe ones. Because otherwise, you will just get lost in the noise and in the, in a large amount of data that are out there because IOCs are actually endless. Now, if we go now to automated remediation, so I think the key point here is the ability of the vendor to have integration in place with various um, um, security devices that you use in your environment, whether it's your firewall or proxies, endpoint solution, or, or SIMs, because this is what will allow you to automatically block a phishing domain, automatically reset uh, leaked credentials, automatically um, um, block phishing sites in your proxy, and essentially, essentially converting the intelligence into security because like I said in the beginning, the idea is not to get more data or more information. This is we have enough. The idea is to actually transform it and convert it into actual security and that can be done by integrating with different security devices in your environment. The second part of the automated remediation is the ability to communicate with various social media platforms a registrars of domains, a page sites, application stores, to make sure that your vendor has the ability to communicate with them, he has a relationship in place to talk to them, and to ask them on your behalf to take down fake social media profiles or, or fake mobile applications. And this is the other part of the remediation, of not only doing internally the intelligence, but also look at the outside 
and make sure that the threats are being removed off the web and not compromise your employees, your infrastructure, or your customers. So it's not only about protecting your, your brand, it's also or knowing about a, a damage to your brand, but it's also the ability to remove the threats off the web and making sure all the hackers out there know that you're watching them and you take down a, a, the fake profiles or fake mobile applications they have developed and released to attack you or attack your customers. So this is really the brief overview of um, uh, the requirements or the RFB that we designed. Obviously, on the RFP documents that we developed, there are a lot more details about uh, the requirements that you need to look for in your vendor, and we'll be happy to share it with anyone who is interested. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Alon. And you can also find out more by visiting the Insights website. I will also include some additional information in the follow-up email, so I hope you will check that out. If you have any questions, you can log them now using the Q&A functionality. I'm going to go ahead and jump right into the questions, starting with you, David. If DTIM does not prevent breaches, why should I prioritize it for a purchase? Well, I think, Raleigh, that that goes, uh, goes back into what we were saying uh, early on. Right. So, so absolutely it's not designed to stop a breach. It's designed to shrink the, uh, uh, the time that a threat actor has to either sell the goods, distribute the goods, uh, you know, or create fraud situations or, or that kind of thing. So in the situation where, where you, know, you think you may be uh, a breach in the future uh, or that you have been breached, then, then this is absolutely a great solution to help you to, to shrink that gap and reduce the impacts from, again, sale or, or some other fraud activity. So I think that's why you want to, uh, to be able to um, uh, prioritize that. Thank you, David. Now, jumping over to you, Alon. You spoke a lot about tailored intelligence. How is the intelligence you provide different than that of FireEye, Mandiant, or ISACA feed? Yes, yeah, so I think that um, the difference is around the relevancy of the threat to your organization. So when we talk about the FireEye or the ISACA feed, for example, then they're really around threats that are out there and not necessarily relevant to your organization in specific. It's threat data about different attacks, malware, or threat vectors that are now active around the world. When we talk about the terror intelligence piece, we talk about intelligence about threats targeting your organization in specific. This is why I, th why I think that when you build a threat intelligence program, you need to start from the terror intelligence meaning start from the intelligence relevant to your organization, and then add on top of it the general threat data that is out there. Agreed. Great, thank you. And Alon, staying with you, this attendee says, the RFP template is a great asset. Why do you think the most important requirement for digital threat intelligence will be in 2018? Yes, so... I think that um, the most important uh, requirement would be about uh, automating the rem remediation process because I think today there is a lot of information out there that is generated from multiple sources, whether it's the dark web, social media, or whether it's from um, different intelligence feeds. This is why I think that the most important requirement would be around automating the remediation. So. A security guy would be able to save a lot of time on the uh, regular automation and remediation processes and really focus on the most important threats that need his attention. So I think it will be around automating the remediation and saving the time in order to focus on the in most imminent threat. Good to know. Thank you. And David, let's take one final question, concluding with you. Are there any specific industries that DTIM is more useful for? What are you seeing? Well, I think from that perspective, it, it, the old adage, follow the money, uh, is really most applicable. So those with a, a very high Internet presence, especially whether, whether it's the social media or whether it's mobile apps and things like that, they're susceptible to fraud in, in those areas, uh, as well as uh, you know, if you're talking about large banks or, or financial industries, uh, 
uh, you know, obviously people want to get to their money specifically. So if someone's broken in to steal information, uh, that could be useful uh, as well. It's, it's not, it's, uh, they're not going to publish the fact that they stole money, but they, if they're able to steal user accounts or create some kind of fraud, that's the case. So I think it really depends on, again, your, your, your overall Internet presence and how you're leveraging the Internet for, uh, for your business. Uh, and two, uh, how uh, how uh, how you relate to money specifically in terms of are you a financial institution or are you something that has cash equivalents, uh, or if, for example, if you have uh, identities that are that are uh, very useful for creating other types of fraud or issues, that that could be the case as well. But we specifically, I see the the financial industries are very interested in this kind of thing as well as. Uh, organizations that have a lot of personal information. Alan, I don't know if you have any, any thoughts on that in terms of your overall customer base or what you're seeing. Yeah, so we obviously see, you know, the, the finance sector is, is, is more targeted and we also have more use cases in the finance sector around uh, credit card leakage, for example. Uh, but I, I also see other sectors that are extremely targeted and get a lot of value from the threat intelligence platform. Uh, we see that you know telecom companies are extremely targeted. Um, uh, we can see that um, uh, gaming and gambling a a a sector is extremely targeted. Uh, having said that, I think that we see all types of organizations in the end of the day provide va get yeah. value from the uh, uh, platform even manufacturing uh, organizations, software organizations. At the end of the day, they all need it, but obviously the sectors that I mentioned um, see more threats in their threat intelligence uh, platform. Thank you both for that insight. And I wanted to thank our audience for taking time out of your schedule to join us today. As I mentioned, you will be receiving a follow-up email from Enterprise Management Associates later today. So I'll include resources from today's webinar, so I hope you will check that out, and I hope that we will see you at a future event. Thanks again, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.